Hey, I guess everybody does know that. Hello, everybody. My name is Jennifer Johnson. Everybody calls me JJ. You can too. This is Jeremiah Davis. He's the Drupal practice lead at Horizontal, and I am a strategist at Horizontal Digital, and I have uh, an admission. I had not logged into Drupal until two months ago. Uh, I am a content management person by heart, and I became an AI enthusiast, and the Drupal team came to me uh, and asked if I was interested in partnering for DrupalCon with the premise that they would give me an environment and I would build in it, and we would come and talk about what we built and why, and then talk about the lessons learned. So that's sort of the purpose of today, and I'm just gonna tee it up with some foundational slides to say who we are. And to start this off with just a question of, do people know what atomic content is? Because it's sort of bread and butter to what Drupal does, I know that now, but it's basically, content that is structured by content types and fields so that we can make those fields actionable. And that's a little bit of what I'd like to talk about today because we've built out 12 or 13 different use cases using AI in Drupal, but there's one in particular I wanna focus on and will. I'm gonna talk about some others, but before I drill into it, I just wanna say, and my mouse isn't working, that we consider these fields and types sort of Lego blocks that we can organize any way we want to. And when we infuse AI into the experience as a middle layer between the content and the presentation, we have an opportunity to do some really cool things. And I say cool things because it's almost limitless. We focused on creating a solution for the exotic problem of knowledge management and the creation of articles that would be used in a call center if you wanted to achieve case deflection. And you might be like, that's the least sexiest topic ever. And I don't disagree, but we chose this specifically because AI is a very scary topic. A lot of people think that the data needs to be really, really sound before we can do a lot with AI. And when we're dealing with call center information and a lot of product information, this is information that's already out there and it's stuff that mainly the device makers want people to know. They want you to know how to shut off your iPhone or to how to organize your contacts. So it's not like by doing this session I was gonna set off alarm bells with the ethicists. We wanted to demonstrate some capabilities. So with that, the purpose of this first demo is just to show how we can use AI to create source article content quickly and accurately that's available for customer self-service to achieve case deflection. That's also very nerdy, but if you operate a call center and you know that your job is to handle calls from clients 24 seven, any efforts we can do to help the customer self-service to achieve case deflection are savings that our companies can get back or our organizations can get back and reinvest elsewhere. So, I'm not gonna get too much into the slideware, but when it comes to AI and content creation, because I was a journalist for a while, I thought that this was sort of a, a weird space to be in when we look at the call center use case of AI, it's sort of a safe space where we're using a hybrid approach of machine learning generated text with manual editing to achieve a first draft that can actually be put out into the ecosystem so that customers can find it. And I have a lot of slides in here that talk about what we built, but this is the initial flow chart we were trying to achieve. If you receive a call and you're in a call center, there's a certain framework that's used to resolve cases. You collect the issue from the user. What environment are they in? What was the cause of the problem? And what was the resolution? And if I'm this person in the middle here, I can look and see in my knowledge repository, does an article exist that helps another customer solve this problem? And if so, I can pull it in, I can talk to the customer about it, I can say, hey, this is how they resolve the issue, and the client goes away satisfied. But if not, what if an article doesn't exist? And I wanna start from scratch in that process. 
then I want to be able to use AI to potentially create a first draft of that knowledge article. And then I'm going to kick off chained AI reformatting, as my glasses fall off the back of my head, to account for content conversion and reformatting, which is dictated down here to the left. So if I'm operating at a call center and I want to produce a type of content, I want to produce an article first, but then I want to produce potentially an FAQ, a step-by-step -step guide, a how-to guide. And then I want to pull all that together into some sort of advanced article or content type that the, the users can use to close their cases faster. So that's what we set out to build. And I'm going to cut to the demo now. And I'm going to go away from my mid-journey prompt, which was pretty good, by the way. I feel pretty good about that. So the first thing I'm going to show you as I pull my glasses back on because I cannot read, is these use cases that we build out. And I'll blow it up. And the first thing I'm going to show you is this notion of using AI in a support case scenario. So let's assume I'm in a call center. I have a support case that's been filed in an ideal setting. This is automated. It's automated numbering, but whatever. I'm going to say what the issue is. A user does not know how to bind contacts in iPhone 13 Max. I can say the environment S resolution, obviously it's iPhone Max 13. I can say the cause, user error. And I can say a resolution, support article, found to resolve case. Whatever it is, this could be more elaborate, but you get it. The first thing we can do with AI is generate a case summary. And what's going to happen is it's going to pull this all together into one field, a text summarization field, that we can say, this is the issue, this is the environment, this is the resolution, this is the cause, and then we can summarize it easily and quickly. Now, assume that this is the foundation for the knowledge article that I have to create as a knowledge worker. I'm going to hop roles here. So I'm no longer in the call center. I'm a knowledge article creator, and I've been given the assignment to create an article that goes on the website so that if Holly, my friend, can't resolve the issue, she goes and finds the support article instead of calling support. That's sort of the value of what we're talking about today. So I'm going to hop over to call center, quick create, which is just POC. This is an authoring environment that can use AI to accelerate the production of knowledge information. So I can go in here and I can say user cannot organize contacts in iPhone 13 Max. And I can create a first draft of that article. And what happens when this goes, it goes out and it returns the payload. I'm going to hop and I'm going to show you behind the scenes what's actually happening before I show you the rest of the flows because it's going to make a lot more sense that way. So I've generated this first article. This button, first draft, is going out and it's seeking a service called AI Augmenter, which is over here. And this is a module that the team hooked me up with that allows me to do the prompt engineering part of this experience. So if I go in to my Augmenter, this is a chat GPT-like interface. It allows me to give my system instructions and my user instructions. My first prompt says, you're the writer of knowledge information for a busy call center. The job, remember, of the system prompt is to provide the context for the computer to make the returns back that it needs to. So you're a writer of a knowledge information for a busy call center. You write content at an eighth grade level. You're an exceptional writer who understands what important information needs to be conveyed. You guys can read. I don't need to read the rest. But down here, 
When it comes to the user context, I'm giving directions as to what's supposed to happen when the user clicks that button. Write a basic support article advising the user how to perform the most basic functions provided based on input. And this is the field that the users fill in. And this can be pretty much what you want it to be. So as you build out your own applications with Drupal, just understand the input is whatever field you want the logic to pull from. So that's how it works on the back end. When I click first draft over here, it creates the payload into this. This is where chained AI comes into play because in the back end of the system, sorry, in the back end of the system, we've got logic that says every button pulls from the combined logic of the, the previous field. So if I want to generate an FAQ, there's formatting instructions in my augmenter to do it in FAQ. May take a bit. I can format a step-by-step -step guide. I can generate an article summary. I can generate out a call center script created just for that purpose. And then on save, I can perform extraction with AI, which basically means look at the payloads and pull out pieces of relevant data that are important to my organization. And we've stipulated keywords. We wanted to understand the user intent. Um, we wanted to extract out any related products. I mean, the sky is the limit here, but what business logic are you hoping to extract from your support articles and why? You can apply that here. And when you press save, we kick off those flows in the back end after I establish my governance behind AI by turning on my flag that says AI collateral is included. This will be the topic of my session tomorrow on governance and AI. Seems like a weird bridge, but had to throw it in there. Okay, so when we save this, again, we're gonna kick off some of those workflows in the background. And this one is gonna take a beat to finish because what it's doing is it's summarizing things in the background so that we can create a text to audio experience for people who may have disabilities. So it's gonna take a minute to get to 100%. Is the interpolator part the same module? It is, the interpolator and the augmenter are separate modules. And then the audio here, I should be clear, is another module. It's called, I think, 11 Labs. We can look it up for that shared for this next part, but those are the three that were used. So if I go into this edit function and I look at my article, I have an audio tab here. If I were to go down, you can see all the fields. It's populated based on the things that we wanted extracted. I also want to point out that this uses the C4K editor so that, CK. see, I work for, this is, I mean, this is gonna be a problem with the group there because I work for a, a group called Channel 4000 and we had C4K as our editor anyway. We have an inline editor here and it allows us to force HTML compliance in addition to other functionality if we want to. So if I wanna make this entire payload proper HTML, we've got the inline controls due to the CK editor that is built in, and it's very convenient because it takes a while for it to cycle through, but it will return out compliant HTML according to our readability standards that we want to establish. Or should, sometimes it takes a while, and sometimes it didn't work. Yeah, I'll do some work on that. If we go up to the article tab here, we extracted on save a summary of this article and this is where we can use text to audio to generate out. We're doing a teaser, but this could be any, any load of, of, of audio that we want to. We can generate out 
learn how to organize contacts on your iPhone 13 Mac. Can people hear that? I don't know. It's Okay. <laughs> I won't bore you with playing it all. Uh, but it allows us to set that tone and voice. If I want to change the tone and voice, we can set up the languages in order to regenerate it. If this was a larger payload of text, we could do the same. So it's really just painting the picture that we can use these atomic fields to isolate out the actions with AI and then pull out what we want to from those fields and then use those fields as the input for other fields to solve other problems down the line. So that is the, the call center cr quick create experience that we sort of just created as a POC. The one I also want to talk about here is the notion of using an atomic content approach for sentiment analysis and pulling analysis out of things like social media reviews or longer form reviews that might be on a product site. Through this augmenter, and I'm gonna hop back over here and look at the prompts, we have within review sentiment analysis as its own prompt, and if I were to scroll down and show you what this prompt looks like, we can establish criteria to judge the prompt output by, or to determine what the prompt output says about the review. So this prompt says, you're going to be presented with user reviews, your job is to provide a set of tags from this list, provide only these tags, and then it's got a series of questions. Does it provide good value or does it cost too much? This is highly variable, it's all written by me. So if I wanted to make this more appropriate for an organization, for a nonprofit, I can change my prompt in order to accomplish that. But for now, I'm gonna focus on, let's say we're doing a product review for a manufacturer, and we'll just go over to house. I'm obsessed with Nano Wall because I want one in my house, so I'll just pick them. And if we go down to one of their helpful reviews, let's find a long one, let's say. Ooh, there we go. All right, don't tell him I'm doing this. Nobody show this to Nana Wall. Uh, it was a long review, could have been a positive review, but I'm just gonna use this one because it'll show what we can do. Okay, so if I go back to my sentiment analysis, I can paste in my review, it's long, I can analyze it. What this is gonna do is it's gonna go out to that prompt and it's gonna return out why it's one star. And who's mentioned in the review? to make it one star. Better yet, who's, who's mentioned in the review to make it a five star? Because if I know why it's a five star, then I can start rewarding the people in my ecosystem who are doing a really, really good job. So that's the better bent. I'm gonna pull out a NanoWall positive review and record that too. But I think it's just about understanding that the language here is the, is the programming. Jeremiah set me up with the actions and the triggers so that we could make the logic work, but it really is on the jobs of the prompt engineers to say, this is how we can return value from those fields, because as long as we can break content up atomically, and as long as we can isolate our AI logic to run off those atomic fields, the sky is literally the limit. And when I say it's the limit, I'm gonna show you one more thing because I think this is pretty cool too. When we get into delivering personalized experiences at scale, which is a little bit of what everybody's here for, whether you're working for a nonprofit or you're working for a digital experience agency, whether you're working for anybody, you basically wanna connect better with your customers. And in order to do that, we're gonna be able to say, maybe we want to take segments and break them down into sub-segments and break those sub-segments down into sub-sub-segments so that our marketing collateral doesn't just connect with a broad cohort of people, it connects with the individuals that are parts of those cohorts. And this is where AI can help because if I'm in the residential architect business, I can generate out sub-segments based on this using AI
This is where the limits of the software system actually probably, there we go. And it's gonna be able to say, look, here's some thought starters about how to take those segments and drive them down into their most granular level. This could be any use case. I'm focusing on architects because I use the nano wall example and they're more in the architect space. But if you're a nonprofit, it's the same thing. Once we can drive the sub segmentation, we can create marketing and digital experience strategies that are based mainly on the person. So I'll stop there and ask before I de dive deep into some of the explanations on the page level of how this works. Are there any questions at the top level or anything anybody has any questions about? What's the overall, I'm sorry, what? Uh, it's AI Augmenter is one, uh, A-U-G-M-E-N-T-E-R, it's like a spelling bee, and then AI Interpolator. And I'll, uh, I have that in my deck that I'll share out, but I think I have it written right here. AI Augmenter and AI Interpolator are the two. Nope, it's core, and it's part of what I'll show you next, because that's, once you build your prompts, and thank you for the seg segue, uh, once you build your prompts, you have to put it on the page and set the controls, and that part of the process looks like this. So if I were to go to my content type for the call center, and I were to look at my fields, the first thing we did is go through, and we established fields behind every piece of that experience, and some of those fields were interpolator fields and augmenter fields that when we went to go put the form display together, we mixed and matched. So article topic at the first, then the button. This is the augmenter button that pulls in the prompt. If I click on this wrench to the right, this is where that logic is set that decides what fields that button pulls from and how it applies that logic. So if I want it to pull from this basic article create button should pull from the title field. It should deliver its output to the body field. It should use this augmenter for its logic. It should use this logic as it delivers its payload to the field, does it append it, does it prepend it, or replace it? And then, if you set conditions at the prompt level, a temperature reading, or any of the stuff that AI results are based on, do we want it to trim the results based on, let's say, a token count? All of those things we can set at the page level so that when we're in organizing the display, it really does become, for the authors, really what field should it pull from and why and where, and then making sure that the fields are all organized properly. And that is the logic that pulls it in together. So that is all part of that augmenter process. The interpolator is about what happens when you save. And that's a little bit different because when you use that module, oh, I'm in the wrong spot, sorry guys. So when you use an interpolator field, let's say I was creating a new field, article, Field three, who cares, I'll delete it, Jeremiah, sorry. Uh, I can say, this is what kind of field it is, then on this second screen, I can say, enable AI interpolator. When I enable it, it's gonna give me a set of controls that had been hidden before, and I can go in and I can say, okay, based on this logic, I wanna follow this. 
This is going to be the advanced settings that say when you press save what happens and what workflows get kicked off. So I hope that makes sense because that's sort of the behind the scenes logic. The other services we wrote or the other prompts we wrote are all about trying to predict what else content authors might want to do with AI. So I'm not gonna show you every single one of these, just know when we started to drill through the call center use case, Jeremiah's question was, well, how long did it take you to do that first use case? And I was like, well, we were trying to follow a lot of logic that we had created in advance, so it took a long time. The other 12 use cases were weekend work. Because we had put the pieces together and I knew how it worked, I knew that I just needed the right prompts in the system in order to accommodate it. I went through and I literally was like, well, here's 15 things an author might want to do. Build these prompts, build these prompts, build these prompts. And then we could go into the page builder and say, okay, let's think linear, linearly about how an author might go through the experience of filling it out. And that's what I would encourage all of you guys to do. Almost think prompt engineering first, what you want the actions to be that the AI is supposed to generate. And then putting the pieces together in Drupal is easy. I mean, it was, I don't want to say it was easy as pie, but, but I'll be earnest when I say I had not logged into Drupal and was not a, a Drupler. Uh, but I am now. I entered the organization and I'm registered and, and I'm on board largely because I work with a lot of enterprise technology clients. And if the challenge I'm given is to show the, the potential of AI, I'm either building applications myself in React, trying to do it in Replit or something like that, or I'm coming to a team like Jeremiah and I'm saying, enable me so I can paint a picture for the people who have to purchase these systems so that they understand the potential of what they're buying. Because a lot of times people blindly buy features in AI without thinking about the problems they're trying to solve with AI. And I came to Jeremiah, I was like, I want to fix this call center problem because it's safe, it's explorable, and it will provide immediate value to any organization or any business that wants to use AI in the right way. Now, I want to talk about marketing because my company came to me and was like, why about the call center, JJ? Just the call center. And we're, we love marketing too. And I love marketing too. I think it's a limitless possibility. I just think with marketing, because it's creative, there's a lot of risk there that will need to be explored before companies should go full bore in. What if legal conditions around AI change? Or I have a creative team that's used images that are not supposed to be used out in the ecosystem and they are not marked as AI collateral, nor are they marked in a way that a regulatory agency would respect any good faith behind the effort. Simply doing the good thing from a governance perspective at the beginning with AI is gonna be the payoff with AI. Because if you don't do it right at the beginning, by the time the end comes, you're already off the rails and there's no recovery. So that's tomorrow's talk, also very festive and fun, as you see. Uh, but I will say I'm extremely, extremely interested in this space because as someone who worked in journalism for so long, I logged into ChatGPT and I thought my job is at stake immediately. Then I thought, maybe it's not at stake. Maybe it's just going to change. And I feel like that's the opportunity for everybody in this room. It's going to change a lot for content creators, which is what I'm mainly interested in, the people who are interested in creating content and creating images and creating video and creating the experiences that are out there. Uh, but it's also just unlimited potential to solve problems if we talk about things from the business problem up. And I want to thank Jeremiah and the Drupal team for helping me and I uh, will answer any questions. I know I ripped through it, but hey, we're at the end of the day and I figured no one was gonna punish me if I finished early. Oh, the biggest applause is for finishing early, I love it.
If you wouldn't mind coming up to the microphone so that your questions can be recorded. Come all the way to the front. Hi. What an excellent presentation. Oh, Got my you. mind uh, reeling. Thank, thank you. Um, could you give us a spoiler for your presentation tomorrow about some of the best ways to set things up? So. Yes. I would love it. Oh, my God. It's like I paid you. Yes. Well, <laughs> Craig, let's talk about this. Um, the preview I'm going to have for tomorrow is if you're going to do this in a CMS, you need to make sure that we've got flags and warnings so that the stuff is labeled correctly. And that's it. If you're going to use an AI image, make sure it has a flag. If you're going to put it in your CMS, make sure that the prompt that is there is logged so that the creator's information is logged as well. I honestly think, because I worked in media so long and we, we got sued a lot by people, not because we necessarily did things wrong, but we operated huge teams with reporters who inevitably made mistakes. If we could show good faith effort, that we tried to do the right thing, that we tried to in earnest protect our interests of our customers and of our employees, that good graces did wonders. And I think I'm just going to talk tomorrow about trying to do the right thing with AI. You know, and, and this is why I love the call center case here. It's like, Nobody doesn't want this problem solved. Even the people in the call center want this problem solved. Nobody likes working in a call center and taking these calls. If we can take the weight off them, they would love it. It helps the enterprises because the information is part of the website experience and the people who go to the websites can find the information they want. So that's the spirit of it all. But if the ask is like, what should your governance strategy be behind AI? I think it's thinking about it first, not being timid, not being afraid to experiment or POC, but honestly, what is it, CYA? You gotta cover your appendix or whatever that is uh, so that you can say that you did the right thing if conditions change, and they will. The Copyright Office is going to hammer down on, these, on, these, uh, on this AI stuff. And I have fun now. I post, post an image of the day. I almost like, I run up to the barrier. I'm like, Charles Schultz, 3D, Peanuts, you know, uh, Pixar. I'm putting it on my LinkedIn feed. I'm not making any commercial gains. But the first person who goes out and produces a, a Christmas card with a Peanuts character that's sold at Michael's through an AI app that someone thought was fun will pay the penalty, and they just don't know they're going to pay it yet. So my advice is think heavily about a centralized asset content and data management strategy because unless the administrators have all this stuff in one place, they're not going to be able to manage it. I don't care where that is. We've had many conversations about different technologies, and I don't even want to say what the technology should be. It's more strategic. It's like expecting the train to come off the rails and protecting the passengers before it does. So that's your preview. It's real peppy. Uh, but I'll have some really good AI art in there, and it's going to be fun. So, uh, All right. Well, with that, everybody, happy hour. Raise your hand. <laughs> Thanks. Now, does anybody have any technical questions? Because I had Jeremiah here. I was like, you have to come up here with me because if I have any technical questions, feel free to come up and ask. Love to talk to you guys. How are you storing all your prompts? Do you get that through revisions? Or, uh, like, what, what are you doing? How it, are you keeping track of when I generated this page, this was the prompt that was written on the website? It is versioning right now, yeah. Uh, it is stored in version control. It's the right question, though, because when I, when I was working with the outputs, I often had sometimes payloads that would return the same thing into different fields, and I had to look and see, well, is it the nature of my system and user prompts of, of how that was set up? So, no, love the question, but use versioning for it. Are you going to open source your, uh, your call center? For you? Sure. <laughs> because I showed you how I built it, I think I just open sourced it for everybody. But, uh, but anyway, hope you guys have a great time, and thanks so much for coming. Appreciate it.